Hello, I'm Ed Raby, otherwise known as the Rabbit Atheist, a former pastor turned atheist, now compassionate anti-theist. Welcome to my channel. Feel free to like or dislike the video as you see fit. So feel free to hit those buttons. Uh, feel free to comment below, and I would appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel and hit your notification bell for more content as it is released. You're also free to share my videos as much as you like. The purpose of this channel is educational, to educate people uh, on the issues of deconversion and atheism in relationship mostly to Bible and theology, particularly from the Christian perspective. Uh, Mostly I uh, work on deconversion, and if you're a person who has deconverted from Christianity into some sort of free thinking uh, aspect of life, you're more than welcome here and consider this uh, your quote unquote safe space. Um, today I'm continuing on in my series of Bible contradictions. Uh, I'm going to stop numbering these and just title them uh, because I think uh, most of these are going to end up being part of a longer running discussion of how the Bible uh, contradicts reality. Uh, in particular today, I want to talk about the Bible and archaeology. Now, when I was in Bible college, um, well, there was a statement that my apologetics professor at the time made. He said, every time a archaeologist spade goes into the Middle East, another liberal critic of the Bible dies. The problem with that is as I went into seminary, I began to study some of this archaeology and realized he was flat out wrong, uh, quite the opposite, in fact. Uh, one of the big things that really began to draw my attention in Bible and archaeology was this, is that as we began to study the area of Palestine, the Levant, or whatever, uh, what you became quickly realize is during the time frame, for instance, of the Exodus, the Egyptians controlled this area. It wasn't controlled by a bunch of random tribes. Uh, whoever wrote the Exodus account clearly assumed that what tribes were there or had been recorded to be there in more recent history had always been there, and that was simply not the case. The Egyptians had controlled the Levant and left a ton of archaeology, archaeological records behind, and it could be easily dated. At the time that supposedly Moses is leaving Egypt and heading into Palestine and wandering in the wilderness, this entire area was also uh, held by Egypt. So there wouldn't have been an attack on Jericho or many other places like this. What you ended up with mostly is just a bunch of you know people that would have been going from Egypt to Egypt. It wouldn't make any sense. And the problem is the timeline from an archaeological perspective hasn't gotten more wobbly. It's gotten more firm as to when Egypt was in control. The very time that Joshua is supposed to be conquering Canaan, Egypt was there living very peacefully and controlling the entire area. It's not that the many of the Canaanite tribes didn't exist. They were under subjugation to Egyptian rule. <clears throat> the fact is, by the time the Bible is actually probably written, Egypt has long passed its glory days, and perhaps the Jews are trying to pat themselves on the back in front of their new masters, saying, hey, you know, we were the ones that first took on the Egyptians, so we're right there with you, pal, taking on those Egyptians. And that seems to be the more of the mythology of what happens in the Old Testament. The fact of the matter is, in large part, what we're dealing with, with in this particular case is a case of people revising history after the fact to fit a more interesting political situation. Hmm, nothing's changed in thousands of years when it comes to politics, and we shouldn't be surprised by this. The fact of the matter is a lot of people wrote like this, but we just don't see it because it isn't as well preserved as the Bible has been because of obvious religious devotion. Now, here's the problem with archeology span and the Bible. It's not that say, every time an archaeological spade goes into the Middle East, a liberal critic of the Bible dies, quite the opposite. In the case of the Exodus, it's gotten so bad that even the most conservative scholars are beginning to think that maybe the story of Moses is nothing more than a mythological origin story of the Israelis. And there's really no, I mean, of all the people that have a vested interest in this story being true, it would be the Israelites and the Jews living in, in Israel today. The problem is, no, no, not really. It just doesn't pan out that way. 
And so what we're really seeing when it comes to archaeology and the Bible is, well, a complete messed up mess. I mean, over and over, I have come to conclude that some of these things just couldn't happen. Some of the most notable characters that have absolutely no archaeological reference to them at all is, oddly enough, the three first kings of Israel, Saul, uh, David, and Solomon, have absolutely no archaeological record. They're also, oddly enough, not mentioned very much when it comes to, uh, say, uh, historical documents of other, uh, of other countries. The fact of the matter is it gets very difficult with archaeology. Now, when we turn to the time of Jesus, we have a bunch more archaeology, but there's still a bunch of things that just don't make sense. For instance, the town of Nazareth up to this day has been well excavated, and several problems do come up in the story. Uh, when I did my uh, series, The Tall Tale of Jesus, I have already covered at this time the idea of what happened in Nazareth. The problem is, it was even worse than what I portrayed there. The story that appears about Nazareth in the Gospels says that Jesus went to the synagogue. There's absolutely no evidence in Nazareth that there ever was a synagogue in Nazareth. Maybe it was at somebody's house, but you can't prove that. You, there's simply no evidence for it existing. The only thing they've ever found at Nazareth to this day that as far as I know, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, is the well. But they still haven't found a synagogue, and they still haven't found, well, a hill. Because in this particular area of Israel, it's flat. There is no hill nearby to Nazareth, and ever has been. As far as we can tell, no one has ever seen a hill near Nazareth for 100,000 years at least, which means the whole story of him being thrown off the brow of a hill just doesn't make any sense. Where did they go? Did they travel 20 miles to throw this guy off a hill? Maybe. Here's the point that I'm trying to make. One of the things you have to be very leery of when it comes to Bible contradictions and the archaeological record is the people that are Christians, the people that want the Bible to be true, will grasp at any straw. But when you look deeper into some of these things, you begin to realize, hmm, they're taking a lot of liberties with this discovery. Probably one of the more notable ones that's actually been brought up to me uh, on this channel was the fact that supposedly archaeologists found Egyptian relics of an army underneath the Red Sea. That has been a long falsified story. What they found was well, a few artifacts that were military in nature. <clears throat> what it means is perhaps a ship carrying some military hardware sank at that point, and somehow some of the cargo, most notably maybe an Egyptian chariot or two, survived. That doesn't mean that there was a whole army there. But this is what biblical people and Christians do with any discovery. They exaggerate it. And you know what? I think this has been going on for thousands of years. Getting back to the story of Nazareth, by the time that the actual story of Nazareth is written, it's 200 years later. The person who writes that story, mm, they didn't really have any knowledge of Nazareth, but they wanted to create an interesting story of how Jesus was rejected by his hometown. It was particularly true and necessary for some prophetic utterances that, you know, Jesus' own people would reject him and reject him in harsh ways. So it stands to reason that he would go back to his hometown, preach to everybody. Everybody would think he was wonderful until he said something that was truly outlandish that pissed them all off. And of course, they got mad, so he gets grabbed and get, almost gets thrown off a hill, but miraculously just passes through them and is unharmed. It's a great story. It's also probably completely 100% fabricated bullshit. Okay, there's no evidence for it. There's no evidence for any of the props in the story. There's no brow of the hill, no synagogue, none of it. So what does this show? It shows that there was a story that went out that someday, you know, Jesus went back to his hometown. Oh, he's of Nazareth. What did Nazareth think of Jesus? And so they created a story. Oh, they didn't like him that much. He didn't do many miracles there. They tried to throw him off a hill. You know, he went to their synagogue and preached a bunch of crap. These are all things that people would have made up not knowing what the layout of Nazareth was. And slowly but surely, they became legend, and legend became myth. 
And slowly but surely, when the gospel writers sat down to compile some of these oral traditions, they, of course, included the story of Nazareth. But today, we now know that the vast majority of the story could not have taken place. There is no synagogue in Nazareth. There is no hill to be thrown off of. And quite frankly, the story is a little suspicious. Why would Jesus continue to be called Jesus of Nazareth if his own Nazareth tradition didn't like him? It seems to me he would have come up with some other surname for himself. That way he wouldn't, you well, know, stand out. He would have been Jesus, you know, uh, something, you know, God's son, whatever. You know, it, it doesn't really matter. The point is this. It just didn't line up with archaeology. A lot of things don't line up with archaeology when it comes to the life of Jesus. Most notably, I, the criticism that most people get, well, you haven't proven Jesus didn't rise from the dead. There's no body. The problem is about, oh, four or five years ago, I discovered something about crucifixion victims. They're all thrown into mass graves. It would be very difficult to separate one body out from another in a mass grave, uh, even today. I mean, I remember when I went to... Uh, the battlefield of, it's uh, in Kentucky of the Civil War, uh, Perryville, I believe it's called. And I was there and there was this mass grave to the Confederate soldiers where 10,000 soldiers of the Confederate army are buried in the same spot, having fought, having stood at that battlefield and seeing the little ridge, the little di deep valley that they all fought through. I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, this must have been a slaughter, and it was. Thousands of people died. When I think about this Confederate mass grave, you need to think about that. What if you were tasked as an archaeologist to go back and go through all of these graves and look at all these bones, even if they were still well-preserved, and try to identify which individual belonged to which individual? You wouldn't be able to do it. You could literally make somebody, if you murdered somebody, disappeared. If you murdered somebody on that battlefield, you could simply throw them in the Confederate grave and, hey, there's no body. And this is exactly what I think happened if Jesus of Nazareth actually existed and was crucified by the Romans. He was thrown into a mass grave. Of course, his body disappears and no way to identify him would be found. So then you create a mythology that he says he came out of a tomb. And the next thing you know, you've got yourself a religion. But the fact is, the reason we haven't found the body of Jesus of Nazareth is if he did exist and he was crucified by the Romans, he's laying there with hundreds of other bodies that were thrown in there. And there's just no way to identify his remains from the remains of anybody else that was crucified. I'm not trying to be rude here, but there's a lot of other explanations of why the body could be missing. And all of them are far more plausible than he walked out of the tomb. This is the thing about archaeology. This is the thing about learning about history and actually taking things that are contrary to your view and, and conflict with your view. You have to read them. You have to listen to them. And archaeology is one of those areas where, quite frankly, the Bible gets contradicted a lot, and rightly so. The Bible just doesn't fit archaeology most of the time. Occasionally, you get a few things, but just, the, you know, I mean... Let's be honest, uh, you know, Homer's Odyssey and Iliad mention real towns that exist. It doesn't mean that they're historical. And just because the Bible mentions towns that actually existed doesn't mean it's historical either. Okay, the issue of history and whether or not the Bible represents history would be greatly bolstered if archaeology backed it up, but it doesn't. The fact is, the Bible often contradicts the archaeological findings that we have probably 95% of the time. And the rest of the 5% is, well, yeah, this is pretty common to all archaeology and all knowledge of the time. I'm spitballing here, and I'm not being exact, but my point is well made here. That it, unlike uh, my professor of a, back in the day, um, who said that every time a spade went down into, an archaeological spade went down into uh, into the Middle East, another liberal critic of the Bible dies, quite the contrary. Every time a spade goes down in the Middle East, the Bible dies, another archaeological death. If you're more interested in a lot of things about archaeology and the Bible, the Holy Kool-Aid does a great job of searing 
of this in his series called Nothing Fails Like Biblical History. He's also done a few other things. I'll link to his channel and you can peruse his channel uh, above my head. Um, I want to thank you all for stopping by and listening to this spiel about uh, Bible contradictions and archaeology. And this is just a basic discussion and an overview. I could literally go into a lot of details here, and but I'll leave that to holy Kool-Aid. But just to say this, that another way that the Bible doesn't con does indeed contradict reality is it contradicts archaeology in a great deal. And archaeology isn't Indiana Jones stuff. It's a true science where you analyze artifacts, you use forensic science, and you use other tools available to them where you try to find out what was going on and how they lived, and you get a pretty decent picture. I want to thank everybody for, once again for stopping by. I appreciate every like, subscribe, and uh, notification bell that's hit. I appreciate you sharing my videos, and so thank you once again. And hopefully someday I can convince you to be a rabid atheist like myself. In the meantime, this is Ed Raby, also known as the Rabbit Atheist, signing off and wishing you a good day.